Welcome to the Minnesota Rovers Tuesday evening presentation. Minnesota Rovers is an outdoors club based in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Our members organize trips that range from one hour to two weeks in Minnesota or further afield. Examples of our activities include hiking, biking, backpacking, skiing, snowshoeing, paddling, and rock climbing. We also organize conservation and trail clearing trips. Our members have experience and skills in many outdoor activities, so if you want to learn a new outdoor activity, we can probably help you. For more information, go to mnrovers.org. Now let's move on to this week's presentation. This week, we're going to learn about uh, climate, including uh, drought and, uh, and other things, and uh, this, this should be really interesting. So tonight's speaker is a climate scientist who grew up in Minnesota with a love for storms, blizzards, and being outside. He works for the DNR's Minnesota State Climato Climatology Office, where he provides the state's agencies, communities, and citizens with up-to-date scientific information about Minnesota's changing and variable climate. He's also an adjunct faculty member with the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate at the University of Minnesota. He enjoys talking to Minnesotans about their weather and often does it long after the workday is done, like tonight. So please welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Kenny Blumenfeld. Hi, everybody. How are you? So my name is Kenny Blumenfeld. This is a, maybe my fifth presentation for the Rovers, perhaps. Current weather, which has been wild, right? So today we are going to talk about our changing climate, emphasizing you know, the warming trend of the past several decades that we have talked about recently, previously, it continues. Uh, that the dry early 2020s actually shows signs or evidence of the wet phase that dominated the 2010s. How can a dry period be evidence of wetness? You might make that face as you wonder. We're going to get to it, and we're, we'll talk about other things too. Um, and you know, bear with me. Interesting technological setup. I will do my best. But in short, the ongoing trends that we've talked about, you've read about for years now, continue. In other words, this warm winter and the dry growing seasons that we've had don't really change anything. Okay? There's nothing that makes us reverse course given the droughts that we've had recently. And the reason that I say that is because I spent much of the 2010s and even the very early parts of this decade telling people, hey, you know, we have ongoing trends towards warmer and wetter conditions. And then you run into really dry growing seasons and people, you know, do you want to change your mind? Is there something, would you like to give us a different, uh, a different answer? because it's been so dry, but we have to remember, we're talking about long-term trends that are decades in the making. And what we've experienced for the past few years, as severe as it's been, as dry as it's been, it does not overturn or undo the long-term trends towards wetter conditions. <clears throat> First, let's talk about what's happening right now. This winter is bonkers, right? And if you're, we're getting all kinds of climate confessions in our office. People come up to us and say, what's going on? It's really weird. I kind of like it. I, I think that the reason that they're doing that is because they have a feeling, a correct feeling, that the warm conditions that we're experiencing are at least partially, if not heavily influenced by our changes in our climate. And so they, they think, well, I should probably be concerned. But at the same time, it's hard to tell Minnesotans not to enjoy a 50 degree day in January, right? And look at what you all just reported. Hiking galore in Northern Minnesota right, northern and central Minnesota in February. You have to remember that it's, we're just coming out of the middle of winter, 
and it's perfectly good hiking weather. There wasn't snowshoeing. He didn't say snowshoeing, cross country skiing. I didn't hear that. I heard hiking, walking around on trails that aren't muddy or icy, right? Amazing. I went for a bike ride in Western Wisconsin two weekends ago that was fully like a summertime bike ride. It was purely recreational, up, down hills, exhilarating. And it was February 3rd or 4th or something like that. This all started really in at the end of November and, and got going in December. And what you're looking at, um, normally when I give these presentations, I, I move around a lot and I point at things and that's gonna be hard because I don't wanna lose the folks online. So see that box with all the dots in it? That is a graph. As you go from left to right on the graph, you're looking at, you're going from cool Decembers in Minnesota to warm Decembers in Minnesota. So, and these are all the Decembers that we have from 1895 through 2022. As you go from the bottom to the top, you're going from dry Decembers to wet Decembers. So the graph is showing you essentially that each December's combination of temperature and precipitation. So if you're way over there on the in the upper right, you're at, you're a very warm and wet December. And if you're over on the lower left, it's a cool, probably cold, cold December and dry. And if you happen to be in the upper left, there isn't much up there. That would be a cold and snowy December. The red diamonds, hopefully you can see them on the screen behind me. I don't dare look or online. But those red diamonds are just the most recent 30 years. So that you could see that there has been a trend towards warmer Decembers and towards wetter December. And remember, these are just these are averages around the state of Minnesota. This is based on uh, a gridded data set. It just means that this isn't a, a specific station. It's an average for Minnesota. So if you are in the Twin Cities, we're usually a little bit warmer than the state average. If you're thinking of International Falls, they're usually colder than the state average uh, on average, but not every year that you get a little more precipitation in the Southeast than in the Northwest. So but these are just averages for the state. The reason I have this box is because this is a, a very reasonable extent of this graph. And, you know, when you break records, people often use the word off the charts. I don't like that term off the charts gets overused. I want it to be special. I only want to be able to say off the charts when something is truly off of the charts. So here's the chart that encompasses all of the Decembers uh, in our homogenized record data set for Minnesota. And here is what happens when we add December of 2023. You see that? What is it? Tell me, what would you call it? Off the charts. Yeah, outside the box, it was very, it was creative. It was a creative December. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Jared? Jared said, Jerry said, outside the box, for those online who couldn't hear the joke. And then I said, uh, yeah, it's very creative. December of 2023 was five degrees warmer than any other December on record. That's an incredibly large margin. You can actually just see it from the space on that graph between it and the next farthest right months. And you, in fact, it's a larger margin than you have in the rest of the top 10 warmest Decembers on record. It's incredible. Also, and this is where we're getting thrown off because there's no snow on the ground, almost anywhere. And so and it has hardly... We can't even buy a good precipitation event this winter. And so we think it must be very dry. 
But if you remember around Christmas time, it actually rained hard, heavily. Well, it wasn't like pouring rain with flooding or anything like that. But it was a good it was a good productive rainfall for December. And in some parts of Minnesota, in central Minnesota, it was a record rainfall for December. And that rainfall event ended up actually supplying almost an entire winter's worth of precipitation. And as a result, December, just because of those three days, was the wettest December on record too. And we don't do that. We don't do combinations of records that frequently the warmest and the wettest in the same month. That is, we don't have any other examples of that. The odds are extremely low. So this was some December. And as you know, yeah, we started January kind of mild. Then we got, we had a week, 10 days of cold weather. And then we got right back into it. Then we went 10 days straight of above normal temperatures, above freezing temperatures. And since January 22nd, we are actually, we began a January thaw on that day, and we are still in it. So here we are in mid-February, and we're still in the midst of a January thaw, the longest January thaw on record in the Twin Cities. St. Cloud's has ended, but it too had its record January thaw. I put quotes around that because we're, it's obviously we're in February now. It's been a bizarre winter. We've had more 50 degree days than any other winter on record. We've had 50 degree days every month of winter, that's December, January, February, for the first time on record in the Twin Cities. We're just, we're so, we're, we're and we have the least snow to date. We've got long records in the Twin Cities. There's, a, there's actually steep, stiff, and deep competition for the least snowfall on record in a season. There's a lot of years sitting at the bottom and we're still below all of them right now to date. Now it's a delicate record, meaning all it takes is a few inches of snow and we're no longer the least snowy winter on record, but across Minnesota, we are way below normal for snowfall, for snow depth, way above normal for temperatures. We're running warmer than any other winter on record over the state right now. And uh, it's just been an amazing, an amazing time. All right, so let's now talk about the general trends. And in case you're wondering, there is a natural component to this warmth, right? I mean, people tend to have a simplified view of how the climate system works, and I try and I try and keep it simple and understandable. But I also want to desimplify some things so that you can understand some nuance. And some of that nuance is that, yeah, the climate is changing because of human activities, but we will always have normal variations in our climate, always ups and downs, whether you're talking about temperature or precipitation. Those have always been with us. They were, it's the climate system responding to what we call internal variability or sometimes external variability. Things like ocean circulation changes, changes in the prevailing uh, wind patterns, the governing air circulation patterns, changes in um, you know having surges in volcanic activity. Uh, these are things that can warm and cool the climate on year-to-year -year levels. El Nino is a big natural variation. It represents a spike during the winter time for us. And we happen to be in an El Nino. So we know that some of this, what we're experiencing, has, has a natural component to it. But on the other hand, this winter is much warmer than you would project just based on the strength of this El Nino alone. You can't use El Nino to explain all of the bizarre warming that we've had. Some of it for sure. But uh, some of it also is on top of an ongoing trend. And this is the kind of nuance that we're going to cover. We have a naturally extreme climate. So we know this, right? Big highs, big lows, whether you're talking about temperature, or precipitation, whether you're talking about, you know, going from nice weather to stormy weather, lots of extremes. We're highly variable, meaning that one year might be cool relative to the normal. 
and the next year, there's no guarantee it'll be the same, right? Look at last year at this time. We had 55 inches of snow already fallen in this area, and there were still three feet left to go. This year, we have hardly had a half a foot of snow. That's just, it's an extreme example of our normal variability that we get here, right? Go, you might have a really hot summer, and then the next summer is cool. You might have a really cold winter, and then the next winter is warm. It doesn't always have to go from one record to another record. It's just variability, just changes. The way that, you know, someday you wake up, you wake up feeling good, and some days you wake up feeling kind of cruddy. We have variability in our lives too, right? No two days are really the same for us. No two seasons or years are really the same for our climate. We have a lot of weather hazards. We know this. Second fact, greenhouse gas emissions cause the global temperature to rise. There's a whole science that's been established. This is not controversial. We've actually known this for over a hundred years, but we've been able to detect it strongly for several decades now. Re remember that greenhouse gases are naturally occurring. That's why we have life on this planet. And the, what they do is when the sunlight hits the earth, the sunlight warms the earth, which then warms the air. And then as the sun goes down, what would normally happen if we didn't have any greenhouse gases is all that heat that was built up during the day would just escape into space and you would have very hot days and very cold nights. Because we have greenhouse gases, we get we have warmer nights, the temperature is regulated a bit during the day, and we end up with a livable planet. However, we've by driving and having a, an industrialized world and for all the reasons we know about, we burn coal, oil, and gas to do these things. It releases more greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide and methane, especially carbon dioxide. And that then increases the retention of heat, causing the global temperature to increase. Those increased greenhouse gases are the cause of almost all of the long-term warming. So on the graph behind me, the graph that hopefully it shows up. Okay, on the graph behind me, you see a straight line. See that kind of diagonal-ish line? It's just a, it's what's called an ordinary least squares regression trend line. It's, it's an arbitrary way of measuring a change in a variable over time based on essentially on principles of geometry. It's not a sophisticated or complicated way of estimating a rate of change. It's the easiest one. And it's just, if you look at that straight line or that diagonal line, it does a pretty good job of capturing the long-term changes in that otherwise squiggly trace. You all see the squiggly trace that it's in front of? You have a question in the back there. I'd like to take them later, but I'll take them later. Yeah. Um, so the ups and downs are just annual temperature in Minnesota. We could see the same thing if we were looking globally or at the U.S. or the Northern Hemisphere or over one of the oceans. There's going to be different amounts of variability, but you'd see ups and downs and a general increase. And the way to think of it is the overall increase that we've seen is mostly human-caused warming from greenhouse gases. But the spikes, the ups, the downs, the variations in between are mostly natural elements of our climate. Climate just doing kind of what it's always done, reacting to changes in ocean circulation or volcanic activity or any of another of a number of other types of uh, sort of normal variations in that system. So when we look at those shorter spikes, you know, on the order of one year to maybe four years, those tend to be natural. So, but notice that these two things can work together. When you pair a spike upwards with that increasing trend line, 
you can get to some unprecedented conditions, which is what we're seeing this December. It, it's not all El Nino and it's not all the changing climate. They actually work together. Sometimes they work together to minimize certain hazards too, right? So for example, we don't get cold the way that we used to in Minnesota. So if you get a big cold variation in our climate, it actually gets minimized a bit. Not as cold as it used to be because there's this background warming. So our low spikes for temperature tend not to be as low as they used to be. You actually see that on the graph behind me. Look at the downward dips. They don't go as low as they used to, even though those are representing variations in the climate that drive the temperature down and that historically would have made the temperature much lower than it tends to be these days. So then kind of putting this together. So rising global temperatures, which are, again, in response to having more greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, they, those rising global temperatures give us access to more heat and more humidity, which is water vapor. Now, water vapor is, or humidity, is just the fuel for passing precipitating weather systems. It's also a form of energy. It's a form of heat energy. So when it combines with high temperatures, you actually feel more heat than you would if the air were dry. So that increased water vapor, increased humidity actually has two effects. One is it can, it can seed or feed or fuel the precipitation generating weather systems. And the other being it can make hot air masses more uncomfortable. For so, Continuing to kind of piggyback on the previous point, our climate here in Minnesota is going through some changes. It's reacting to these other fat forces. It's, we have more access to heat and moisture because global temperatures are rising, because there's, we've added greenhouse gas concentrations to the atmosphere. If you're wondering, by the way, why are we having, why would there be more moisture? What does that have to do with heat? It's, it's not lockstep, but when you increase the temperature, you also increase the rate of evaporation. We've got enormous oceans and that's a, that they represent enormous quantities of water. So if you raise the temperature of the air over those oceans and also in the oceans, you increase the rate of evaporation. Evaporation is just removing, is just moving water from the liquid phase into the gas phase. In other words, it's taking liquid water and turning it into humidity. That's really all it is. So that's, so there is a relationship. And, and it's not that every place becomes more humid as global temperatures rise. It's more like there is more humidity available for the areas that have access to it. Here in Minnesota, with the Gulf of Mexico due south of us, whenever the wind comes from the south, we get an influx of boosted moisture. So, for example, this winter, as dry as it has seen and as warm as it has been, you wouldn't notice that we've been breaking humidity records, dew point records. We've broken eight days since December 1st, have daily high dew point records in the Twin Cities because there's just more water vapor available with that, uh, with that warm air mass. So in Minnesota, and we're different, not every place has the same symptoms. Some places, almost all places globally are seeing their temperatures increase, but not everyone's getting wet. Here in Minnesota, we are on average. So more precipitation, more humidity, higher temperatures on average. There's, there's a sort of method to this madness. If you heard us discuss this at other talks when we talked about how the climate is changing, our biggest warming signal is in the winter time. It's counterintuitive because people think warmer must mean hotter, must mean hotter summers. We don't have that here in Minnesota. And in fact, it's really been the slowest change to take hold globally. And this is actually because the greenhouse effect 
has a stronger effect in the winter time. There's more heat escaping during the winter time, so there's more heat to retain. So the temperatures increase more during the winter time than they do in the summer. So, so our winter and overnight temperatures are really kind of driving our overall warming trend. We are getting warmer in the summer, but not nearly at the same rate. We're getting more precipitation, more precipitation extremes. Our summertime high temperatures and drought severity have yet to show actual increases. Over the long term, I'm not downplaying the severity of the drought over the past few years. It's just we have to help people calm down a little bit sometimes, right? Because here in Minnesota, where we have a lot of extremes and where there's this growing cognizance of the fact that the climate is changing and there is this big kind of global change in the climate, we get we get a lot of people who call us every time, you know, there's a big thunderstorm. It's this climate change. And we get to point out that not everything that we have is getting worse. Not everything. And drought, this drought, as bad as these last droughts have been, they don't really stand out historically. They don't stand out from the rest of the record of droughts that we have. Whereas some of the high precipitation extremes that we have experienced do. The record snows of last winter, the record rains of the 2010. These were things that historically we had no record of experiencing. But summertime high temperatures and intense drought episodes are still behaving so far the way that they always have, which is probably fortunate because it would be a lot for us to balance if everything was getting sort of worse. I know that's a subjective term, but it's how a lot of people think of it. I like all the weather, so I don't actually think of any weather as worse, but I'm just trying to kind of keep it in simple terms. Uh, good news, tornadoes, hailstorms, straight line wind storms really show no signs of becoming more severe, larger, more frequent. But what they have shown is a seasonal expansion. As the warm season has expanded to take up more of the calendar, the severe weather season has followed it. And the ranges for severe weather geographically have expanded. So in 2021, we had a tornado in the boundary waters, which is unusual. And in October, which is unheard of, became the farthest north tornado on record in the United States so late in the year. This October tornado crossed over into Canada. And it was a big tornado, knocked over a lot of trees, flattened a lot of trees. And we thought this is a big event. This is the, the event of the year. One of the most, even with drought that year and all kinds of weird things that had happened, that this is one of the signature events of the year. And then two months later in December, we had a full-on tornado outbreak in southeastern Minnesota with hurricane force thunderstorm winds and 20 plus tornadoes. And we had never had tornadoes that late in the year. And one of the reasons we're doing this, you know, it's not every year, but we're seeing an expansion of the severe weather season is because we're also seeing an expansion of, of heat and moisture. Even though the extremes of temperature haven't really increased in the summertime yet, we're seeing enough heat and moisture that can produce severe thunderstorms arriving earlier than we would than we used to see it and also later than we used to see it. But it's important to note that there's really no evidence anywhere in our region or in the country that, that tornadoes are becoming stronger than they've ever been or more frequent than they've ever been or that hailstones are larger than they've ever been. There's really, uh, this is one branch of the science that's been, it's been hard to find consensus because there's a lot of uh, kind of conflicting information, which we don't find with things like winter temperatures. There's no conflicting information. You have unanimous agreement upon among research studies that have been done on temperature trends. <laughs> new hazards have emerged that we're not used to. They're not truly new hazards, but there's been an expansion of wildfire in forests, and that leads us with 
you know, more polluted air. Okay, so you already looked at that graph on the on the right a bunch of times, uh, and it's just showing as an example that temperature and precipitation. I'm not sure if you can can't really see the precipitation behind the temperature. On the left, left is left left is a, a dot graph that's just showing annual temperature and precipitation averaged around Minnesota. So it's kind of similar to that December graph, but this time it's compared to 20th century averages. And then we've just turned the top 10 combined warmest and wettest years red. And what you see, all of those red years have been since 1998. So the it's not that every year is warmer than the year before. It's not that every year is warm and wet, but there have been more combined warm wet years in the recent three decades than any other time on record. And they've tended to be, you know, a uh, higher magnitude of warmth and or wetness. Here's how the temperatures are changing in, in Minnesota. On the left, that's just average annual temperature. You can actually see northern Minnesota warming faster than southern Minnesota. This is the total temperature change since 1895. So to put this in perspective, southern Minnesota has essentially warmed at about the rate that the globe has warmed. That's fairly close to the rate of warming, the magnitude of warming that we've seen globally. Northern Minnesota has warmed by, what would that be, 70% more, essentially. So and on average, Minnesota is warming faster than the global average, faster than the national average. But as you can see, that's really being driven by central and especially northern Minnesota. And if you want to know how temperature is changing, look in that middle map, which is winter low temperatures. Northern Minnesota, typical winter low temperature is now seven degrees above what it was at the beginning of the 20th century. The colors on the map on the right don't really, uh, they're not working on my screen, so they, you're probably not seeing them either, but the numbers are the correct numbers. And what that shows you is that in Southern Minnesota, summertime days actually, it's not significant statistically, but they don't show any warming trend since 1895, the, uh, and, the, uh, and in only central and northern Minnesota, is there any warming trend during summer days? But note that in both those cases, that trend is less than the annual average and far less than what we see with wintertime low temperature increases. So winter is warming much faster than summer. That's the bottom line. We are getting warmer in summer but not at nearly the rate of winter and especially winter nights. And in fact, international falls, this January just ended, so we have fresh statistics. International falls is the ice box of the nation, cold weather test center for batteries and engines. They have, they were in a legal battle with Fraser, Colorado because Fraser, Colorado wanted to be the ice box of the nation. This is one of the pettiest and hilarious, most hilarious disputes, International Falls just finally was like, you know what? We win. They are cold location, but the typical January low temperature, January being the coldest month of the year in the ice box of the nation, which is truthfully the coldest first order weather station in the lower 48. Average January night is now 11 degrees warmer than in the middle of the 20th century. Rapid warming. And if you're wondering what's the effect of having this warm January that we just went through, through last year, the number was more like 10 degrees and change. So, it's, you know, it has an impact. But, yeah, ten. you could just say 10 plus degrees of warming of the overnight lows in International Falls. Doesn't mean that they don't get cold. It just means that when they get cold, it's typically less severe than it used to be. It's often less frequent than it used to be. What we used to think of as cold, 
eh, doesn't happen so much anymore. What we now think of as cold used to be pretty common. You can see the same thing out in Western Minnesota in Milan, best weather station, cooperative weather station in the state. And it's definitely one of the very best in the country. This is a three generation rural family. They've been doing these measurements since the 1890s. And there's no urban heat island. And so we could just use it to track the lowest temperature of the year, the 15 lowest temperatures of the year. And what you see, you know, lots of ups and downs. Remember our climate has normal variations. We're never gonna just be every year warmer than the next. That's not gonna happen. We're in the middle of a continent. We're halfway between the equator and the North Pole. We're, we're the same distance from the Gulf of Mexico as we are from the mountains and as we are from the Canadian prairies. There's just too much variation when the wind shifts directions for us to ever have a homogeneous climate like you have in Hawaii. But so you see the ups and downs, but you also see the long-term trend. And you can look at the, so on the right side of the graph, you see a downward spike. Sort of look at the farthest right dot, blue dot, that's low. See it? It's like, it's a negative 33. It's from 2019. That represents what would now be considered an extremely low temperature. If you think you can see that dot, and again, this would be where I'd normally be pointing right at it. But uh, if you think you can see it, now just look left and you can see how common what's now extreme used to be in terms of cold. And then keep your eyes on the left side of that graph and look at all the lower values that we simply don't observe anymore. This is, this is essential, you know, and honestly to you and me and to the average Minnesotan, well, what's a few degrees? I mean, doesn't this mean that our winter temperatures or winter conditions are on average more survivable? Yes. Yeah, our winter air temperatures are less lethal now. Yes, it does mean that. So what's the complaint? Well, I mean, I'm not complaining personally. It's uh, you'll save on your heating bill. But I know I can give you an example of something that might be complaining. Ash trees, right? The emerald ash borer actually gets held at bay by temperatures that are lower than negative 30, depending on how much, you know, how much insulation they have, or negative 35. So when you get a cold outbreak in the winter, that prevents them from overpopulating. When you don't get to those cold weather thresholds, they can have lots of multiplication. And the same is true with the Eastern Larch beetle that has a similar relationship with the tamarack trees in Northern Minnesota. Held at bay by low temperatures, Eastern Larch beetles, a natural predator, always been part of the environment. And the quasi symbiosis is that the cold weather keeps them in check and that keeps some balance in the population of tamaracks and Eastern Larch beetles. When you start losing the cold weather, you get you can get overpopulation of the beetles. They start having a feast on the trees. They eat faster than the trees can reproduce and the trees population plunges. So there are ecological effects. It changes the uh, plant hardiness zone. As we mentioned, the extreme humidity is beginning to increase. The highest dew point uh, of the the highest annual dew point at 6 p.m. for st standard time. So it's 7 p.m. in the summer. It's not a sharp increase, but there is an increase. And again, we're setting dew point records here in the winter. So it's not just the green sea of extra corn in the summertime feeding extra humidity. There's also just more water vapor in the air that's present. Meanwhile, if we look at the highest temperatures of the year, same, we're back in Milan, and we see this all over. It's just that they have the best data, so we use them heavily. Look at the highest temperatures of the year. There's no trend. You can even see the most recent years on the far right side of that graph. There's no indication that we're leaving the historical ranges. 
So we're getting warmer, but we're not necessarily getting hotter yet. However, the climate models, you know, you can look around at some of our neighbors, other parts of the U.S., where they have started getting higher temperatures in the summertime. Arizona this past summer, Portland, Oregon in 2021, parts of Canada, parts of Europe. There are parts of the world where uh, higher temperatures in the summertime have arrived. They just haven't arrived here. And the climate models are pretty much unanimous, suggesting even in the rosy scenario that is projected on this map behind me or on your screen, which shows this is from an old generation of climate models. This is the everybody figures it out, gets along. Uh, we all start limiting greenhouse gas emissions. But there's so much additional carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere already, plus the feedback with additional water vapor, that the number of hot days is projected to begin increasing, even in this very optimistic scenario. Sometime, we don't know exactly when, but sometime by the middle of this century. So has it begun now? Maybe, but we don't have any proof. We don't have any evidence. We don't have any way to detect it. Is it, uh, maybe it'll be within 20 years. But more hot days, which is what this map is showing, more days where the temperature is 90 degrees. And it's good for us to think reflexively. Here's the high temperature history, highest temperatures on record in Portland, Oregon. I use Portland, Oregon because it, its climate resembles ours in western Minnesota in many ways. Hot weather climatology, you know, the highest temperature is 107 degrees. They have a lot of They've had historically a fair number of days that um, have hit 100 degrees or higher. But as you can see, not, not an abundance of them. Not like Phoenix, Arizona, where they, they do that kind of thing 25, 30 times in a normal year, maybe even more. But so if you were just to do what we've been doing and look at the record for Portland, Oregon, you would never... You don't see an increasing trend. You don't see anything suggesting these highest temperatures of the summer are getting higher. Record high temperatures are being broken all the time. You don't get any sense of that. And there's 2021, where they added five entries to their top 50, and they in, in sequence went, you know, hot, hotter, hotter again, new record, 108 degrees. New record again, 112 degrees. And then the final record, 116 degrees. So in the course of a few days, Portland, Oregon's all-time temperature record went from 107 degrees to 116 degrees. And as you know, if you paid attention that year, it was a disaster. Their infrastructure, their wires couldn't handle it. Their streets were buckling. There was no way to cope with the heat. But there was a town in Canada just on the other side of the border that temperature hit an all-time record, and then it burst into flames the next day. Meanwhile, for water, we're getting, on average, wetter. I'm just going to move ahead here. You can see that in Minnesota, our precipitation increase, and, you know, I just added 2023 to this graph, and, you know, it was another dry year on a statewide average basis, and that is moving the trend line to being less steep. But we still have a long-term, since 1970 or so, a long-term increase in precipitation. So if we had looked at this four years ago, the trend was steeper. It was sharper. But now the effect of four dry years is starting to affect, starting to influence that trend line. But we're still getting wetter in the long term. This hasn't reversed the trend yet. We don't have a downward precipitation trend. And again, this is a simplified way of looking at changes over time. But there's other things that we can see. The heaviest rainfall of the year in our long-term historical stations. It's not always increasing everywhere every year. But we have seen, if you look at the top, a tendency for more as you go from left to right, and especially in the last 50 years or so, a tendency for higher magnitude events that hadn't been observed before being kind of one-upped every five to 10 years. So it's sort of fanning out. So we still have plenty of years where the heaviest rainfall in the state is as heavy as it's just the same as it's ever been. But we also have a lot of years where it's breaking new ground. 
There's a video that may not work for those of you online. Gooseberry Falls, nice place to hike, except not on this day after they had received about a five inch rainfall. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I don't know about that, but. And even in drought, we've had four dry years. We can actually still detect this trend towards wetter conditions. We've had episodes of extreme wetness and flooding even in the last four years. So for example, picture on the left is from the Rainy River in 2022. It had extraordinary flooding because of a very wet winter historic flooding in that area, some of the worst flooding it had ever experienced, record precipitation in International Falls. Same year, Minnehaha Creek dried up. Prior to Rainy River flooding in the spring of 2022, the previous year, it had been about as low as it had ever been from extraordinary drought. So we're just gonna step through this. Northern Minnesota as mapped, looking at their January through August precipitation. It was the third driest on record in 2021. That sent the region into what's called exceptional drought, highest level of drought that the drought monitor issues. But then following that, um, what are they? oh, that's the same thing. Then from December of 2021, into May of 2022, parts of that same area experienced the very wettest December through May that on its record. And, that, and look at that spike. They'd never even been close to that amount of precipitation. So they went from third driest January through August with a slight pause in the fall and to the very wettest December through May. Then in the summertime of 2022, right after that, central Minnesota, right here, we went into, we had the driest June through October on record. On a statewide basis, September and October of that same year, very dry, fourth driest on record. And then look what happened. Then November, look, I just said, September and October 2022, fourth driest on record, and we followed that immediately, November through April. Now we're getting into this last winter, third wettest on a statewide basis, all the way back through the records. But this is having an effect. Then we go, <laughs> we did it again, really dry growing season, fourth driest May through August on record this past year. What's happening is all of that, those dry values that you saw in the annual precipitation, those four years, it's all being driven by suppressed growing season or warm season precipitation. That red graph on the top, that's May through September. See those, see those red dots that are way below their respective trend line? Meanwhile, the cold season precipitation has been behaving, has continued its upward trend, normal ups and downs, and in some cases has been extraordinary. This sounds, this sounds pretty pedestrian. Who cares? So sometimes it's dry and then it's wet. And you get dry and wet. What that's doing is it's leading us. So on this graph, I've highlighted 2021, which was the driest year of the last four years. That's a little dot on the kind of lower on the right side of that graph. All of those circles represent years prior to 2021 that were drier then. So as, ex as extreme as our drought was in 2021, you actually have, it was actually the 29th driest year on record because it was bolstered by extra precipitation falling when it was cold making the drought itself kind of unremarkable. In fact, this whole period, these last four years, really represent 
the wettest dry period on record in Minnesota. Weird, it sounds funny. But for how dry it's been, it's just quite wet. And we're seeing all these, you know, we're seeing heavy snow on average increasing across Minnesota, even as our winter's warm. We're seeing more winter rain, what this graph shows. And when you combine wet snow, heavy wet snow with rain and inside of a warm winter, you get the destruction of forests like we had last winter, the most damaging winter on record in Minnesota. Killed millions, potentially tens of millions, maybe even hundreds. I mean, we can't even count how many trees were, were crushed by the snow last year. It's almost impossible to do a full survey of. But where, the, where it's sampled, it's extremely high mortality. And in areas much smaller than a county, you get well into the millions pretty quickly. So this is, you know, wet snow and rain and winter becomes a problem. You see roofs collapse and things like that. And again, the severe weather season, although not getting worse in terms of magnitude frequency, it is expanding. Here's that tornado outbreak uh, shown on radar with all of the warnings animated as these storms come out of the past into southeast of Minnesota on December 15th of 2021. At the time, it set a record for the most hurricane force wind gusts from any severe weather event in the history <laughs> in December. And then, of course, as we've had warmer conditions and particularly warmer winters, it's softened up our forests, it's made them more vulnerable. We've had, uh, they've had to cope with basically being pushed out of their normal comfort range, especially the northern forests, northern Minnesota, up into central Canada. So no wonder, then you expose those weakened trees to drier conditions, hotter conditions, you get a lightning strike, you get fires, and now you've got a massive, the biggest wildfire outbreak on record for Canada, driving all kinds of smoke into the central and eastern U.S. as we had last year, last summer. It's not that these are happening every year or all the time, and it's not that they had never happened before. It's that for this generation, these represent emerging hazards of, with which we don't have much experience in the kind of in the Midwest and the eastern parts of the U.S. And all indications are as the climate continues to warm, we're going to continue to have weakened ecosystems that are more susceptible to fire, which means you know we're going to have good years, and then we're going to have more years where maybe we have to deal with degraded air quality from smoke. All right. So wrapping it up, thanks, you've been patient. I probably blabbed about an hour beyond my, my time, but thank you. Minnesota's getting warmer, wetter. We're in our wettest period, wettest dry period on record. I should, that should say dry. But we just finished our wettest period on record. The 2010s were had more precipitation than any other decade, and 2019 had more precipitation than any other year on a state average basis. We've had more frequent and larger extremes. Even when you account for the current drought, you can still see these trends, as I shown as I showed you. We're of course warming rapidly, profoundly during the winter time. Uh, all the projections indicate kind of more of what we've experienced. That will keep, you know, we'll keep getting warmer and we'll keep having precipitation increases. But then also, as we showed with the 90 degree days, at some point we're going to get more high summertime temperatures. And once that happens, you'll be evaporating more water. So our drought severity will probably increase with that. Severe weather season, although not worse, it's expanding. And as we just mentioned, we have the hybrid emerging hazards from wildfire and drought. And I call them hybrids because they're not, they're not direct, they're indirect effects of the climate, right? And there's other factors that make wildfires happen. It's not just the climate. So it's kind of a hybrid. Air quality is a tricky one for us because it's, it's not strictly a meteorological variable, which is what climatology concerns itself. But it's in the air and people care about it. So we have to, we had to find a way to talk about it. Thanks everybody. Uh, Jerry, if you have questions from folks online, I can take them if you have questions here. I don't want to stand in the way of your happy hour, your socializing, your breakout groups. 
but I will stay as long as, you know, I'll stick around for a few or several questions if there are any. And if there aren't, I'm out of here. I'll leave. I'm happy. To. Uh, Barry. But I live down by the airport. Mm -hmm. And in the dry summer and stop, we've got this big, nice, juicy storm coming in from the north or the west. And then you see it come to the city and it just disappears. And then it reforms either east or south. So I'm figuring that's the heat island effect. But is that getting changed by by climate change or is that just just a weather thing? Okay. Great question. Thanks, Barry. So this is uh, this is a fascinating observation, this idea that where I live, the storms break up. And there's some truth to it, and there's also some myth to it. And I'll try and deal with both. So in the city, moving precipitating weather systems that aren't particularly intense can be disturbed by the built environment. So we do see kind of weak to moderate thunderstorms, especially when they form lines, as they approach the cities, they sometimes will bifurcate or break up. However, if they have enough instability and enough support from the conditions aloft, they will blow right through. And this is why there isn't a desert at the airport or a desert in the Twin Cities, right? They, we actually have the same amount, and in some cases more precipitation, than, than surrounding areas. So there are conditions where, yes, we will be, if you live in the urban area, you will be deprived of small thunderstorms that are moving into the area that can't overcome the barrier of the buildings, more so than the urban heat island. It's the building barrier effect that's been studied by the kind of fluid dynamicists. Um, but there are also situations where the same effect will hang up a, a line of thunderstorm right over us. And that's why one of the biggest floods in Twin Cities history was centered on South Minneapolis in 1987, and another one 10 years before it in 1977 that actually caused the state fair to be evacuated because there was flood water four feet high across the entire state fair. Another thing that would fuel this observation of thunderstorms weakening is that when we're in drought, which we've been for four straight years, there's less, the, the atmosphere is already deprived of its primary ingredients that it needs for thunderstorms. And so what, what happens is when you do get enough, there's just enough for one isolated thunderstorm or maybe two, and they very quickly consume everything available and they just peter out randomly. So there were times the last summer, for the last three summers in particular, where, you know, one area would get two and a half inches of rain in 24 hours, which is a good rainfall, but three miles away, there was nothing. And that's all, that's just a drought, a drought signature. And then the last piece, which is the most fascinating one, is that, and we, is that almost everyone everywhere has this same observation, which is amazing. It's, it's a social science phenomenon. It's that, there's always a thunderstorm over there. There's always a thunderstorm somewhere else. And the, the, one of the reasons is, is because somewhere else is enormous compared to right here. And so the probability of having a thunderstorm somewhere else is infinitely higher. But we hear, we hear from farmers. And, and one, of the, one of the dangers of it is when you get into severe weather, the, ex, the intense thunderstorms producing hail and high winds and tornadoes, is that there are... Over the years, been these kind of, these kinds of myths passed on from generation to generation. Oh, tornadoes are always over there. The mound protects them, and then and what's actually happening is statistics were protecting. Them. Tornadoes are very rare. If you if you and some fun facts about tornadoes. If you see one, you're much more likely to be several miles away from it than to be within striking distance. If you are within five miles of a tornado, you're still dozens, if not hundreds of times more likely to simply see it. The chance of being hit directly by it, very, very low. So people will build a little probabilistic model in their head that says, well, I've seen two tornadoes. Well, one was over there, and one was over there. This area must be safe. And then people 
believe it. And they think, you know what, we're not even going to invest in sirens. This happened a lot in the 1950s and 60s as towns were expanding and growing across the Midwest and the plains. And people were like, well, there are no tornadoes here. They've always been over there. And then this newly developed town gets absolutely obliterated by that rare tornado that actually goes through. So I, it's also the, the reason I have such an animated answer is I studied for my dissertation the frequencies and probabilities of tornadoes in the Twin Cities and in downtown Minneapolis. And so, you know, trying to do public education on this kind of thing was a big part of my work because downtown Minneapolis has been hit by, has been hit by tornadoes. The actual skyline has been hit. And Minneapolis itself has more tornadoes than any other community in Minnesota. So we have a rich history of the severe weather in our area. All right. Any other questions? I found the 7.3 increase in winter temperature in northern Minnesota fascinating, but what I also, and I know you study Minnesota more than elsewhere, but how does that compare to Arctic areas of uh, North America? Great question. So basically, most of the warming that we're seeing is because of increased greenhouse gases. Fact, even before we increased greenhouse gases, the Arctic regions, the high latitude regions had a stronger natural greenhouse effect than equatorial low latitude regions. This is true. This is astronomers and space scientists have learned this when they've theorized and studied other greenhouse planets. The greenhouse, if you have greenhouse gases and the planet is spinning and it's semi spherical or spherical, it tends to produce a stronger greenhouse effect away from where the sun is the strongest and a weaker greenhouse effect where the sun is the strongest. It's just part of the way that the heat, the heat balance is kind of regulated. So, great question. And what we see on Earth is so, so one way to just kind of back out, if there was no change in the climate, what you could, the way you could think of this is that the heat, the temperature of the poles is subsidized by the areas that have the most direct, by the, by the tropics and the equator. They're borrowing heat that's borrowed through the winds and then through extra retention from, from greenhouse gases. It's not that the greenhouse gases are more concentrated in that region. It's that there's a longer window of losing heat in those regions. And so we see this play out in real life. And then when you add in the change in climate, the rates of change, the rates of warming are on average, there's gonna be little variations with topography and all kinds of other things, but on average, the rates of warming increase as you go farther north in the northern hemisphere and increase as you go farther south in the southern hemisphere. So that map I showed of Minnesota goes right off into Canada. You see increase, increase, increase. In fact, even this winter, as warm as we've been, the anomaly, the unusualness of it is much stronger in areas of Canada off to our north, where on the days where we were 30 degrees warmer than normal, they were up to 50 degrees warmer than normal. So they might not have been warmer than we were. That wouldn't be happening. But they were relative to what's typical there. They are actually, even in a winter like this, having a stronger residual warming effect. Great question. Thank you. Ironically, it might we might get our biggest snow of the winter tomorrow night. And, and and all it would take is a little over two inches to do that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching this Minnesota Rovers presentation. If you want to see more, please click on the link to our channel or the subscribe button below. Thank you.